If you take a rational functions, you are only going to get exponentials, real or complex. That is all, nothing else. Exponentials and polynomial times exponentials, that is all. That is the only class which is going to give you rational functions. But if you take the Bessel's function, it is a higher transcendental function and if you take its Laplace transform, you are going to get something which is not a rational function, correct. So, you see the, you see the, our technique, one more, uh, one more technique you are now learnt of, of finding inverse of a Laplace, inverse Laplace transform. Again, this is also a, it will not exhaust all possibilities, all right. So, now let us turn to the proof of the theorem. The proof of the theorem is not difficult. So, that is why I am going to do it here and you must have seen uh, the theory of power series, right. What do you know about a power series? When you take a power series, what, what is the, what are the possible regions of convergence of a power series? It can be, it, a power series can converge for all complex numbers or it may not converge for anything except the center sigma n factorial z to the power n, sigma n factorial z to the power n. Apply the ratio test and you will realize that it only converges for 0 or take sigma z to the power n, converges when mod z is less than 1, diverges when mod z is bigger than 1. On the circle of convergence, there will be points of any uh, of either kind, there may be points of either kind, whatever. On the circle, that situation becomes complicated. Within the circle of converge, within the circle, it is absolutely convergent, outside it is divergent. Any other possibilities for the geometry of convergence of a power series? Radius of convergence, yes, but is, is can the region be anything else? Is there any other? No, no, the maximal domain, the do maximal domain of convergence, the domain of convergence of a power series is a disk, that is it. It is an open disk, it may or may not converge at some or all the points on the circle, correct. And you understand how do you prove this? You should look up the proof of this you will compare it with the geometric series. Suppose the power series converges at z naught, take the power series sigma a n z to the power n. Suppose it converges at z naught, z naught is not equal to 0, 0 it always converge, uninteresting case. Suppose you have the information that the power series converges at a point z naught other than the origin, then what do you know? the series converges. So, its terms are bounded, right. So, a n z naught to the power n must be a bounded sequence. So, mod of a n z naught to the power n less than m, correct. Now, write mod a n z to the power n multiply and divide by z naught to the power n, correct what will you get? Mod a n z to the power n equals mod a n z naught to the power n into mod z by z naught to the power n, correct. And the first piece mod a n z naught to the power n is bounded by m. Therefore, mod a n z to the power n is less than or equal to m times mod z by z naught to the power n. In other words, we are comparing the series with a geometric series with ratio mod z by z naught. So, as soon as mod z by z naught is less than 1, it will converge. So, the conclusion is that if a power series converges at z naught, then it will converge at all points inside the circle 
center at the origin passing through Z naught, right? As soon as it converges at Z naught, draw the circle passing through Z naught with center at the origin. Inside this circle, it will converge absolutely. Correct? So, the moment you know that there is one point at which the power series converges other than the center, then you have a disk on which the power series converges absolutely. Then what is the next step? Take the union of all these disks. You are taking the union of disks, open disks centered at the origin. The union is also going to be a disk. It could be the whole complex plane or it will be the proper disk of finite radius. That is is that clear? This is how you will begin the theory of power series. Now, the theorem that you are going to prove is very similar. In spirit, the theorem is very similar, the proof is very similar. That is why I went over this exercise of recapitulating this important aspect of the theory of power series. So, is this proof clear for a power series? How do you prove that the domain of convergence of a power series is a disk? All right. Now, let us turn to the proof of the theorem. What is given to you? f of s equal to n from 0 to infinity a n upon s to the power n plus 1. It converges for mod s bigger than r. This is the information is given to you. What are you cooking up? f of t equal to a n upon n factorial t to the power n. What do you have to show? That the Laplace transform of this is this. First thing we have to show is, does this series converge and if so, where? The first thing we have to understand is whether this series converges or not. Correct? It is a power series. So, this, this kind of a trick that I just mentioned is what we have to employ. So, now pick a t naught which is bigger than r. So, this part particular thing will converge when I put s equal to t naught, correct? That means that a n upon t naught to the power n plus 1 is less than m, correct? So, now I write a n, n upon n factorial t naught to the power n equal to a n upon t naught to the power n plus 1 multiply and divide by t naught to the power n plus 1, correct? And this particular piece over here is less than m. And what is left over is t naught to the power 2 n plus 1 upon n factorial. Very interesting. Correct. So, now what is the next step? Take the nth root because I am going to apply the Cauchy's nth root test. So, the nth root of this whole thing is less than m to the power 1 over n t naught squared t naught to the power 1 over n upon nth root of n factorial. Very nice. t naught to the t naught squared is a constant, innocent. m to the power 1 over n as n tends to infinity, it goes to 1. Mod t naught to the power uh, 1 over n as n tends to infinity, it goes to 1. What about the denominator? nth root of n factorial, how does it behave? How does nth root of n factorial behave? How do you go about doing that? What is the behavior of nth root of n factorial? Yeah? Wonderful. So, you prove that nth root of n factorial raised to the power minus 1 goes to 0. So, a n upon n factorial t naught to the power n, nth root goes to 0. Correct? So, by root test, we conclude that sigma a n upon n factorial t naught to the power n converges and t naught was anything with bigger than r, any real number bigger than r, correct? So, the power series converges for arbitrarily large positive real numbers. 
Therefore, therefore, the radius of convergence of the power series is infinite. So, the series 2 here, this power series here has infinite radius of convergence. In other words, the f of t is an entire function. The f of t is a entire function. That is the first piece of information, an important piece of information. The next thing to do would be to show that the function is of exponential type restricted to the real line, we have to show that f of t is of exponential type. And the third thing to do would be to show that taking the Laplace transform term by term is valid. All these things have to be done, <laughs> correct? All that you have done now so far is to show that the infinite series converges, the power series converges for all values of t. All right. So, thus sigma a n upon n factorial t to the power n converges for all t. The claim, the sum function is of exponential type when restricted to, when restricted to 0 infinity, the positive real line. We have to make estimates we have to make an estimate of mod f, make an estimate of mod f, mod f t less than or equal to a n upon r plus 1 to the power n plus 1 into, it should be r plus 1 here. Okay. The power series, no? What is the power series? A n t to the power n upon n factorial. I am multiplying and dividing by 1 r plus 1 to the power n. Correct? Agree with me? I, I allowed? But once again, we know that this thing is less than m exactly as in the previous case. This is r plus 1 t raised to the power n, correct? This is r plus 1 t, r plus 1 t, all right, fine. f of t was what? Sigma a n t to the power n upon n factorial, I am multiplying and dividing by r plus 1 to the power n plus 1. So, a n upon r plus 1 to the power n plus 1 mod is less than capital M by the same argument as before. And what is left over? I am having sigma r plus 1 t raised to the power n upon n factorial. That is the exponential series m r e to the power m r e to the power r plus 1 t. So, finished the function f t is dominated by an exponential function. So, it is of exponential type. The same argument plus dominated convergence theorem will tell you that term by term, Laplace, taking the Laplace transformation term by term is valid. What are you doing when you take the Laplace transformation term by term? You are multiplying the series by e to the power s t and integrating it term by term, correct? You are multiplying the infinite series by e to the power minus s t and you are performing term by term integration, which basically means what? You are exchanging a summation and integral. So, which theorem are you going to apply? The dominated convergence theorem or use our good friend, the dominated convergence theorem. So, the dominated convergence theorem is and for performing the dominated convergence theorem, you need an estimate, right? Estimate has already been done. You have to use the same estimate and it allows you to exchange the summation and integration and you get this. 
So, the Laplace transform of little f is capital F. In other words, Laplace inverse of capital F is little f. So, this procedure has been completely justified. All right. So, finally, there is a lot of time left, there is 15 minutes left actually. Hmm? Now, we started 10 minutes late, remember? We started 10 minutes late and there is 15 minutes left. <laughs> no, the Laplace transform is an integral. That is true. It is not a finite sum, it is an infinite sum. So, what is an infinite sum? It is a limit of the sequence of partial fraction, uh, partial sums. Na? So, the partial sums will be S n of t, S n t e to the power minus s t integral and then the limit, the limit has to be taken inside the integral. Correct? Yeah, what is the confusion all about? What is that? What is the discussion? What is the talking all about? You are discussing whether we whether we started late or, or not. Yes, we did start late. There is no doubt about that and there is no doubt about the fact that there is 15 minutes left. Both these are absolute facts. So, here is a set of exercises for you. Huh? No, 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 according to this clock. The, the, the relativity will come in only when there are several clocks to be synchronized. There is no synchronization of clocks uh, necessary. Here, please write down these. Um, these are very important uh, formulas. They are all related to the earlier exercise I gave you. Find the Laplace transform of e to the power minus b over s upon root s. That amusing integral that we are going to do, the merry-go-round which you are going to take. These are all related to that, the first four problems. The last four, the log function has to be expanded into a series. Remember that s is large, remember s is large, so a by s mod will be small. So, log of 1 plus z as a power series you have to expand. So, you have to expand these things by a power. That is the same procedure for all of them. This illustrates the technique that we have applied. Right? So, there are 8 of these, there are 8 pieces. Right? So, please hurry up, so that we can finish the thing in time. We have to start the convolution theorem now. have to start the convolution theorem. Well, otherwise I will have to lecture in the afternoon sometime. It is going to be equally painful. At least now you are fresh. So, please hurry up. We will do the convolution theorem and its applications and then finish the thing. After we finish the convolution theorem and its applications, then there is a great deal more to be, then there is a great deal more to be done. The, uh, the tautochrone property of a cycloid, we have to do. No, convolutions is a purely analytic concept. It is a very important technique, it is a very important idea, but it is very useful in analysis. Okay. Done? All of them are similar. The procedure for doing all these exercises is similar. e to the power minus a s, you have to expand it as a power series. 1 minus a s plus a squared upon s squared, 2 factorial and things like that. So, as far as how to do the problems is concerned, it is pretty easy. Have you seen these exercises, these kinds of things in your Laplace transform courses? But you only do rational functions rational functions and partial fractions of them. That is all. But these are interesting. This will give you a wider class of functions, which are much more interesting than 
by partial fractions you can only get exponentials and polynomial times exponentials. You cannot get Bessel's functions and stuff like that. Right? Done? Shall we proceed? I hope you are not slowing down deliberately. <laughs> All right. So, let us do the convolution theorem and its applications. Suppose f and g are two functions, the convolution is defined to be the integral minus infinity to infinity f of x minus t g t d t provided the integral exists. Remember the definition of a convolution is integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of x minus t g t d t. This is the only definition of convolution. The convolution has something to do with the group structure of the real line. So, the integral has to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. The real line which under addition that is the group under consideration. The integral does not go from 0 to infinity or there is no other range. We are not looking at the multiplicative group. We are looking at the simple additive group. You see the x minus t over here appearing. Please remember this. The convolution has something to do with the group structure and here the group under consideration is real numbers under addition and so the integral has to spread from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, now the it is quite easy to show that if f and g the integrals of f and g exist, I, I mean they are absolutely convergent integrals, then the convolution will also exist and moreover the convolution will also be integrable. That is very easy to show, but unfortunately when we are studying Laplace transforms, we are not going to be working with functions for which mod f is integrable over the real line, correct. The functions which you are going to be working with will vanish on the negative real axis number 1, number 2 on the positive real axis it will have exponential growth, correct. So, that condition that mod f should be integrable over the whole real line is false, will be false for the for this particular case. So, now what we are the convolution, the kind of convolutions that we will be working with will always be of a very special type. Okay. So, what we will be doing is we will take an f and a g and you multiply the f by the heaviside function and g also by the heaviside function. What is the heaviside function? It is 1 on the positive real line and 0 on the negative real line. In other words, I am clipping f and g with the heaviside function and then take the convolution. Let us see what happens to the convolution. When you take f h star g h of x, integral goes from minus infinity to infinity all right, f of x minus t h of x minus t g t h t. Now, thanks to this h t over here, I can go uh, the integral will go from 0 to infinity f of x minus t h of x minus t g t dt. Now, because of this h of x minus t, when t exceeds x, h will become 0. So, the integral only goes from 0 to x. Okay. Now, where does this come from? If x is negative, then h x minus t will always be negative because t is running along the positive real axis. So, this will anyway be 0. So, when x is negative, this is going to be 0. So, the final answer is going to be 0 when x is negative and for positive x is going to be given by this integral. Krasik takes this as the definition of convolution without the heaviside function. For him, f star g is simply this. I do not agree with this. In fact, I would pronounce it as wrong. Convolution has to do with the group structure, I repeat. And real line, uh, the, the interval 0 to x does not form a group under addition. 
the convolution integral has to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. What is happening right hand side is a, is a convolution of f h and g h, it is not the convolution of f and g. Please remember this, do not change the definition of convolutions, change the functions, take f and g, multiply them by the heavy side function and then proceed, but do not change the definition of convolution, it is wrong, all right. So, let us look at an example. Let us calculate convolution of f h with itself for the special case when f t equal to h t only. In other words, I am looking at convolution of h t with itself. The formula is given to you h x 0 to x h t h of x minus t, correct. h t will go away because it is 1 in this range. So, it is simply h x into integral 0 to x h of x minus t. But this is also 1, so it is simply x times h x. The second example that I am going to take is f of t to be 0 if t is negative or bigger than the characteristic function of the open interval. The characteristic function of the open interval compute the convolution of f h with itself, compute the convolution of f h with itself. Let us work out this exercise. F h star with f h x is h x integral 0 to x f of x minus t f of t dt. This is what we saw. Now, we bifurcate it into two cases, x is between 0 and 1, in which case the integral from 0 to x f of x minus t f t, this f t of course will go away, because x is between 0 and 1 and f of t is 1 there. So, I am simply left with 0 to x f of x minus t dt and this number, this is simply the number 1 and so after computing the integral I just get x. So, the answer is x when x is between 0 and 1. What happens when x is bigger than or equal to 1? The integral of from 0 to x will go from 0 to 1 plus 1 to x, this go back to the integral, go back to this integral. f of t is 0 beyond 1. So, the second integral drops out. So, I just have to calculate integral 0 to 1 f of x minus t dt. Again the situation bifurcates into two cases. If x is bigger than 2, remember t is running from 0 to 1. So, if x is bigger than 2, then x minus t will be bigger than 1 and the thing will be 0. Correct. So, it is 0 if x is bigger than 2, but what happens before that? It is simply x minus 1 to x. Remember that x minus t of course, is uh, has to be positive and it has to be less than 1, right. You need x minus t to be bigger than 1. So, t has to be, uh, t has to be less than x minus 1. So, in this case, if x is between 1 and 2, if x is between 1 and 2, then this f of x minus t is going to be 0 outside this range. So, this is the only range that survives, correct. Mm -hmm. x minus t has to be between 0 and 1 for this to be non-zero which means that t has to be less than x and t has to be bigger than x minus 1, t has to be bigger than x minus 1. So, this, this is the only range, So f of a, the, but f is 1 in this range and the answer is 2 minus x. So, what is the wonderful uh, conclusion? The convolution of f h with itself is 0 when x is less than or equal to 0, x between 0 and 1, 2 minus x between 1 and 2 and 0 beyond. The, what is the graph? A triangle, 0 outside of 0 to 2, between 0 to 2 it is a nice symmetrical triangle, correct. All right, so we will stop here today. And we continue tomorrow with 
Laplace transform. That will be the fourth session of Laplace transform. Tomorrow we will state the convolution theorem and it will prove it. And we will see several applications, applications to ODEs, initial value problem for ODEs. We will solve integral equations of convolution type, integral differential equations of convolution type. We will look at the Abel's integral equation and the Tauter-Crohn property of a cycloid. All right. After that, if time is left, we will discuss what to do later.